Hey guys, and welcome to our seventh example video following our course on abstract algebra. Now, today's video is going to be on cyclic groups, so with the introduction out of the way, let's go ahead and get into our first example for the video. So for this first example, what we want to do is find all of the generators for Z15 and Z12. So what we're going to need to do is find all of the numbers that are relatively prime to 15 and 12 respectively, between 1 and 15 and 12 respectively. So for the first one, so I'll go ahead and write for Z15, we have the following list of numbers. Well, let's see, we have one, and then we will have two as well, but not three as three divides 15. And then we will have four, and then we will not have five as five divides 15, and six contains three, so that will not be relatively prime to 15. Then we have seven, and then we will have eight. We will not have nine because that also contains a three. Then we will have a 10, which contains a five, so we can't do that. And then we have 11. And then we can't do 12 because that has a three. And then lastly, we will have 13 and 14. Great. So next, let's go ahead and do Z12. So once again, we wanna find the list of relatively prime numbers to the number 12 from one to 12. So we will have one, we will not have two or three or four, but we will have five. We will not have six, but we will have seven. We will not have eight and we will not have nine. We will not have 10, but we will have 11. And that is all the numbers we have. Great. And so you can check that this will actually generate all of Z12. So let's go ahead and check for a number like, let's just say five. So all the numbers generated by five in Z12, let's go ahead and write them out really quickly. So first we will have five, well then we'll have five plus five, which is 10. And then we will have five, and then we will have 10 plus five, which once we reduce mod 12 will be just three. Then we will have eight, and then eight plus five is 13, so that will give us a one there. Then we can add five to that and we will get a six. Then we can add five to that and we'll get 11. Then when we add five to that, we will get a four once we reduce mod 12. Adding five to four, we'll, you will have nine. And then when we add five to nine, we will have a two. Then adding five to two will give us a seven. Then once we add five to seven, we will get to 12, which once we reduce mod 12 will just be zero. And then adding five again will bring us back to the start. So you can see that if we check all of these, we have one, two, three, four, five, all the way up to 12. So this number five will generate the entirety of Z12 as will the rest of the elements which I've listed out here for you for Z15 and Z12. Great, so let's go ahead and get into our next example. So for this one we wanna find all of the elements which are generated by 18 which is a subgroup of Z27. And to do that we are simply going to do what I just demonstrated for you in the last problem. So all we have to do for this problem is take powers of our 18 here, which since this is an additive group, we will just add 18 to itself and see what we can generate with that. So let's go ahead and start with 18 plus 18. Well, 18 plus 18 is obviously equal to 36, but that gives us our first element generated by 18 here, and that will be nine, because once we reduce 36 mod 27, we will get a nine. Great, so from here we can add another copy of 18, and we'll have nine plus 18, but we'll see that nine plus 18 is simply equal to 27, but once we reduce that mod 27, we will just get zero. Great, and then we can see that if we just add another copy of 18, we will be right back where we started here at the beginning, so that means the entire list of elements uh, generated by 18 will be the group zero, nine, and 18. Great, so that finishes this example off, so let's go ahead and get into the next one. So for this problem, we wanna find all generators of C18, and just like we did for the first problem, we are going to want to find all numbers relatively prime to that number 18, so let's go ahead and list them here at the top. So starting off, we have the number one, two is not relatively prime to 18, three is not relatively prime to 18, four is not relatively prime to 18, but we do have five, which is relatively prime to 18. Six will not be relatively prime to 18, but we do have seven. 8 is not relatively prime, 9 is not relatively prime, and 10 is not relatively prime, but we do have an 11 here. Then we know that 12 is not relatively prime, but we have 13. 14 is not relatively prime, 15 is not relatively prime, 16 is not relatively prime, but we do have 17 here. So that means the list of all of our generators for C18 here will be as follows. We will have just R, then we'll have R to the fifth, and then we will have R to the seventh, 
r to the 11th, r to the 13th, and then lastly we will have r to the 17th power. Great. And you're free to check on your own that each of those will generate the entire group of C18. So let's go ahead and get into our next problem. So for this problem, we want to find all generators which generate the same set as is generated by R15. So to start this problem, let's go ahead and find what is generated by R15. So to start us off, we'll have R15 times R15, and that's just going to be equal to R30. But once we reduce that mod 21, that will give us our first element uh, generated by R15, and that is R9. Next, we can go ahead and multiply by R to the 15th once again, and once we do that, we will get r to the 15 plus 9, which is just going to be equal to r to the 24th. But that's going to give us another element because once we reduce mod 21, we will get r to the third power here. Great. So now we can go ahead and multiply by r to the 15th again, and that's going to give us our next element, which will be r to the 18th, which we do not have to reduce. So now let's go ahead and bring this down here, and we can continue. So we'll have r to the 18th, and we'll go ahead and multiply that by r to the 15th once again, and that will give us r to the 15 plus 18, which will be r to the 33rd power. So we'll have r to the 33rd, but once we reduce that, mod 21 that will simply give us r to the 12th power there which is our next element and then we can go ahead and multiply by r to the 15th once again and that's going to give us r to the 27th but once we simplify that mod 21 we'll simply get r to the 6th power then we can go ahead and multiply by r to the 15th one last time and we'll get r to the 15 plus 6 which is just going to be r to the 21 or the identity element e Great. And we can see that if we multiply by r to the 15th again, we will get right back where we started. So let's go ahead and tally out, tally up this set here. So we have the set which is generated by r to the 15th. And that is going to be equal to, well, starting off, we'll have the identity element there. And it's pretty easy to see here that we all of our elements generated by r to the 15th are just increasing powers of 3. So we'll have r to the 3rd, r to the 6th, r to the 9th, r to the 12th and then r to the 15th, and lastly, r to the 18th. Great, and so from this list right here, it's extremely easy to see that we will have a generator for r15 given by r to the third power, and that is actually the only generator of r to the 15th here, and you're free to check that on your own if you want for homework. Great, so let's go ahead and get into our next problem. So for this problem, what we want to do is determine the subgroup lattice of C sub P squared times Q with P and Q primes. Let's first look at the set of divisors of P squared times Q. So that set is going to be given by the following. So we will have one P, P squared, then we will have Q, then P, Q, and then lastly, P squared, Q. And so we can relate these divisors in the following way using a lattice structure. And in this lattice structure, our arrow will mean is a multiple of. So I'll go ahead and write that up here. We will have a multiple of. And then we will start at the top with our p squared q, as none of these other elements will be a multiple of p squared q. So we can go ahead and write our p squared here, and then we can write our p q over here. And then let's go ahead and put our q here and our p here, and then we can just put our one here. And we can see that we will have the following structure here. We'll have that p squared q is a multiple of p squared, but it's also a multiple of p q, but it's also a multiple of q and a multiple of p, and obviously it is a multiple of one. Well, p squared is a multiple of p, and p is a multiple of 1, and in the same way, p, q is a multiple of q, and q is a multiple of the number 1. But we also know that p is a multiple of p, q, and of course, p squared is a multiple of 1, and p, q is a multiple of 1 as well. So I'm going to go ahead and simplify this diagram right here by using transitivity to remove some arrows. So let me go ahead and do that now for you. Great. So there we have it. We have a simplified diagram of what we just drew on the left there where I just simplified using transitivity. Great. Now from here, I'm going to use the fundamental theorem of cyclic groups. So I'll go ahead and write that down. 
And so I'm going to go ahead and abbreviate that as FTCG. And so by the fundamental theorem of cyclic groups, we know that C sub P squared Q has a unique subgroup for each divisor. And so next what I want to do is note the following relationship between a divisor, which we'll call K. So we have a divisor K and the subgroup that is generated by it. And so using this, we can derive our final subgroup lattice for C sub P squared Q. So at the top, you're going to write out the entire group. So we'll go ahead and write that as G, which is equal to C sub P squared Q. Great. And so for our first subgroups, we will have G to the P and we will also have G to the Q here. And those will both be subgroups of the entire group, which is generated by just little g there. Then we will also have on the right, on our left hand side here, G to the P squared, which is a subgroup of G to the P. And then over here, we will have G to the P Q, which is a subgroup of G to the Q, but it is also a subgroup of G to the P. And then lastly, at the bottom here, we will just have our identity here, which will be given by what is generated by P squared Q, which is just equal to the identity there. Great. So I didn't actually explicitly write it for this diagram, but the arrow for this diagram means is a subgroup of. Great. So this is our subgroup lattice for C sub P squared Q. So let's go ahead and get into our next problem. So for this problem, what we want to do is find a collection of distinct subgroups M1 through MN of Z sub 124, such that we have the following containment for the subgroups where we have each successive subgroup containing all of the previous ones. Great. So let's go ahead and get into it. So to begin this problem, let's start by looking at the factorization of 124. So 124 is going to be equal to two times 62, but that's equal to two squared times 31 and 31 is prime. And we're gonna use this factorization to help us with our subgroup containment. So we know since our group here, Z sub 124 is cyclic, we have the following relationship between our MI so that so that the order of each mi must divide each of the successive mi in the following way. So we have the order of m sub i divides the order of m sub i plus one, etc., all the way up to dividing the order of m sub n. Great. So we're going to go ahead and use this to our advantage to construct the largest collection of distinct subgroups possible. So let's go ahead and start doing this by doing the easy ones, which are the ones on the ends right here. So let's go ahead and let our M sub one be equal to 124, which is equal to just the identity element. As the identity is a subgroup of every group, and by the same token, let's go ahead and let our other end, our M sub n, be equal to the group generated by the number one, as that is equal to our entire group Z sub 124. So every single group will be a subgroup of that group. Great. And so for our remaining M sub I, we will choose them by dividing out our factors of 124 from greatest to least going from left to right so that we can maintain our containment condition as given. So let's go ahead and write out what will happen when we do that. So on the far left here, we will have our identity or just what is generated by 124. And that will be a subgroup of, of what we get when we divide it by 31, which we already know will just be the number four as we already calculated the prime factorization of 124. But that will be a subgroup of the group generated by the number two, which will be a subgroup of the group generated by the number one. And there we have used all of the prime factors of 124. So we have constructed this chain with the largest possible n. Great, so that finishes this problem off. So let's go ahead and get into our final problem. So for this one, we want to prove that the multiplicative group of non-zero rational numbers is non-cyclic. 
So we're gonna do this by way of contradiction. So let's go ahead and do that now. So let's go ahead and abbreviate that BWOC. So by way of contradiction, we are going to suppose that the multiplicative group of non-zero rational numbers, which I'll just abbreviate as QX, I'm not going to explicitly write out that this is non-zero, but I will note that verbally here. So we're gonna suppose that this QX is cyclic. So by the definition of it being cyclic, then it must have some generator. So then there must be some generator. Let's just call, go ahead and call that generator Q. So there must be some generator Q, which is a rational number. And let's go ahead and write that Q in the following way by the definition of it being a rational number. So we'll have that Q is equal to A over B, and we'll have that A and B are both integers, which are relatively prime. So I'll just go ahead and write that down here with A and B relatively prime. So we've used the definition of our group being cyclic here to say that to say that there is a generator, and we've used the fact that this generator must be must be a rational number to write it as the quotient of two relatively prime integers. Great. And so from here, we are going to take a prime. So we're gonna take a prime, let's just call that prime P. And we're gonna choose this P to be larger than any of the divisors of A and B. So let me go ahead and write that now. Great, so we've taken a prime, which we can do by the fact that there are infinitely many primes that is larger than any of the divisors of A and B. And then we want to consider the following rational numbers. So we want to consider 1 over p, which is a rational number. Great. Well, if it's a rational number, then that means it can be generated by our generator. So since our number, which 1 over p, is rational, it can be generated by a power of our generator. So I'll go ahead and write that. It can be generated by a power of our generator, so by a power of A over B, let's just call that power M. So from here we are going to have two cases. So case one is going to be the following, and that is that one over P is equal to A to the M over B to the M, and that will be with our M being greater than or equal to one. So if that's the case, we will see that b to the m is equal to p times a to the m, which of course implies that p is a divisor of b to the m, but we cannot have that. That is no good, as we have picked our p to be large enough such that it is larger than any of the factors of our b, which means it will not be a divisor of b to the m. Great, so now let's go ahead and look at our second case. So our second case is going to be very similar and that's when one over P is equal to A to the M over B to the M. But in this case, our M will be less than or equal to negative one. And so when we do our calculation here, we will have our B on top and our A on the bottom because of the negative exponents. And so that will mean that we have A to the M is equal to P times B to the M. And so what that means, of course, just like the other one, is that P divides A to the M. But just like before, that is no good as it would invalidate our choice for P. But this is a problem as we have neither case is possible, so thus we have arrived at a contradiction. And what did we contradict? Well, we contradicted our supposition that our multiplicative group of non-zero rational numbers was a cyclic group. Great, so that finishes this last problem off, and that's a good place to stop.